In the last video for chapter three, we're going to take a look at two more examples of subgroups, which include the cyclic subgroup and the center. The first subgroup we want to look at is the cyclic subgroup. It kind of seems silly to study the cyclic subgroup right now because we haven't talked about cyclic groups. We are going to dive deeper into that in our next chapter, but let's go ahead and get a nice little preview. So if G is a group and A is an element of G, then we say that this means the subgroup generated by A is a subgroup of G. So essentially we're saying that A is a generator and we're going to take A to every power. And what's going to happen in a cyclic subgroup is it's eventually going to get back to E, which is A to the zero power. So let's take a look at what I mean by that because it's gonna make a lot more sense when we look at an example. We already know the group U10. So remember the group U10 is elements um, that are less than 10, but relatively prime to 10. And the operation is matrix multiple, I'm sorry, not matrix, is modular multiplication. So essentially we're saying that one would be one to the zero, one to the first, one to the second, and so on and so on. Now, what's going to happen when I take one to the zero and one to the first and one to the second? Well, the only thing I'm going to get is one, which is in fact the identity. So while one, the subgroup generated by one is in fact a subgroup, it doesn't generate every member of the group. So if the element generates every element of the group, we say that the group itself is cyclic and has a generator of A. So let's keep looking at U10 to see if there are, if in fact this is a cyclic group and if they have any generators. So let's look at three. Remember three would be three to the zero, three to the first, three to the second, which is nine, three to the third, which is 27, but we're mod 10, so 27 is actually seven. And then if I go to the next one, three to the fourth, it's actually going to bring me back to one. So as we can see, U10 is in fact a cyclic group that is generated by three. Well, what about seven? Because a group can be generated by more than one element. Looking at seven, I have seven to the zero, seven to the first, seven squared is 49, which is just nine. Uh, seven to the third is 243, which is three, and we would end up back at one. So seven does generate every element of the set. If I look at nine, nine to the zero is one, nine to the first is nine, nine squared is 81, which is one. So one generates only one, nine generates one and nine. Those are both subgroups. Oops, wow, let me just try that again. These are both subgroups. As are three and the, um, sorry, the groups generated by three and seven. So all four of these are subgroups. They all include the identity, all of the, um, the subgroup tests would be met. I'm not going to go through that test with you, but they would all be met, um, obviously closed and so forth. But we can also then say that specific to three and seven, that three and seven generate the entire group. Now let's look at Z10. So Z10 is a little bit different because this operation is addition. So it's, it's modular addition. So it's going to be a little bit different. So instead of 
1 squared, 2 squared, and so forth, we would be looking at multiplying instead. So instead of powers, we're multiplying. This goes back to multiplicative notation versus additive notation um, that we talked about in chapter 2. So what can I say about 1? And I'm not going to go through all of the elements. But 1 would just be 1 times 0. Whoops. 1 times 1. 1 times 2. 1 times 3. 1 times 4. And so on. So I'm going to get all of the elements. So 1 is going to generate the entire set. Well, what about 2? 2 is going to give me 2 times 0, 2 times 1, 2 times 2, 2 times 3, 2 times 4, 2 times 5. That's back to the identity. So 1 does generate the entire set, whereas 2 would generate only the even values of our set. Again, both are subgroups, but we only have certain generators. So we didn't go through all of the values in Z10, uh, but we know at least one does generate every value in the set. We've spent some time in this class talking about the dihedral groups. So let's look back at D4 and talk about if D4 has any generators. And we're not going to go through all of the generators, but I do want to talk about what each element does generate. So if I look at R, remember R would be r to the 0, r to the 1st, r squared, r cubed, and then r to the 4th in D4 would go back to the beginning. So r to the 0 we call the identity, then r to the 1st we just call r, and then r squared, r cubed. So we can see that really we're looking at the elements in the center of our Cayley um, graph. What about f? Well, F would just be not flipping at all, which that is the identity, and then flipping. And then if I flip twice, what happens? Well, I go from E to F on a flip, and then I would go back to E again. So that is a subgroup, but it doesn't generate the entire, um, entire set of D4. So, so far, we don't have any generators of D4. What about RF? Well, if I take RF and not do it, I get the identity. If I take RF and perform the action, so that's RF, I get RF. And if I do RF again, that would be RF. Notice I'm back at the identity. So again, it is a subgroup, but it is not, um, does not generate D4. Now, I want you to notice the difference in notation between RF and R comma F. So if you have two elements, what we're saying is it's whatever's generated here and whatever's generated here and anything that you can generate with them together. So obviously, I already know that I can get E, R, R squared, R cubed. But with F, I can also get... EF, which is F, RF, which is RF, R squared F, which is R squared F, R cubed F, which is R cubed F, and now we can see that we have actually generated the entire D4. So looking at R and F, a rotation and a reflection, I'm generating the entire set. And I'll leave it to you to see if there's any other combinations of rotations and reflections that generate D4. Let's talk now about the other subgroup that we wanted to talk about in this video, which is the center. So the center of a subgroup, I'm sorry, the center denoted Z of G of a group is the subset of elements in G that commute with G. So essentially we're saying any element that's in G where AX is equal to XA for every element of X in G. So it has to commute with all elements in G. So for instance, is E an element of the center? Well, it would make sense that EX 
is equal to xe for all x's in g because that is exactly what the um, definition of the identity tells us is that ex is equal to xe for all x and g so yes the identity element will always be in the center so is the center a subgroup yes it is we just discovered that the identity is an element of g now we're going to let a and b be in the center and show that a b x is equal to x a b so that's fairly straightforward because a x b oh sorry let's try start at the beginning a b x because a and b are in the center i know that bx is equal to xb so i can call that a xb and because a is in the center then ax is equal to xa and so therefore i can say that abx is equal to a i'm sorry xab so that was fairly straightforward now let's assume that a is an element in the center so we must show that a inverse is an element in the center so again fairly straightforward if i start multiplying i already know that a x is equal to x a so let's multiply by the inverse on the left hand side and multiply by the inverse on the right hand side so left hand side right hand side so what is that going to give me these two cancel out i get x a inverse these two cancel out to give me the identity so i get a inverse x so i have just shown what i need to show so it meets all of the requirements to be a subgroup since we've already refreshed our memory on the dihedral group d4 um, let's look at both d3 and d4 and see if we can determine the center of each group so we already know that the center is going to include the identity and that's for each group and that makes perfect sense because i can choose any element in either group say r squared it makes complete sense that e r squared would be the same as r squared e we know that the identity doesn't do anything and so whether i do perform the identity whether i do nothing at the beginning or nothing at the end it's not going to change so we know for sure that's true so now the question is are there other elements that i can put in either order so that commute with every other element of the group so we could certainly do this the long way and start by checking r and saying okay does r commute with everything well let's choose f and say does rf equal fr well rf gives me rf and fr gives me r squared f so that's not the case so in fact i've shown that r is not in the center and that f is not in the center well let's try r squared is r squared f the same as fr squared so r squared f and then f r squared nope not the case so again i've already now shown that r squared is not going to commute with everything now what about what's the last one that i haven't tried um rf so i believe i've tried the rest of them so rf goodness gracious let me just try again rf so is rf and let's go ahead and knock out two birds with one stone r squared f does that equal r squared f rf well let's take a look if i start at e and i say rf and then r squared f okay i'm at r squared now let's try the other way r squared f and then rf that leaves me with r so again those are not the same so i've pretty much shown that the only thing in the center the only element in the center of 
D3 is the identity because I've checked all of the other ones. Now I can go through and do that as well for D4, but let's take a look at what we know about say RF. Essentially what I know is that RF has to equal RF inverse in order for the element to commute or the two elements, whether it's R and F, but we're just going to use R and F as an example. So for R and F to equal RF inverse, I need RF to equal, this is sock shoes property, F inverse R inverse. Well, what's the inverse of F? How do I undo F? I just do F again. So really I'm looking at when does R the same as R inverse? Well, obviously the identity, which we've already put in the center, but what about for D4, what about R squared? Does it make sense that R squared would be the same as R squared inverse? So if I do R squared, is that the same as moving twice in the opposite direction? Yes, it is. So let's just test it and make sure that works. If I take F R squared, would that be the same as R squared F? So let's start at E. F would take me to F, and then R squared would take me to R squared F. Start at E, do R squared, and then F. Did it also take me to R squared F? Yes, it did. Now we can check it against all of the elements, but in fact, this is going to work because R squared is its own inverse. So for D3, the center of D3, we have only the identity. In the center of D4, we have the identity and R squared. Let's take a look at one more example of the center. In this case, we're looking at the general linear group 2R. Remember, that just tells me that I'm looking at a two by two matrix where all entries are real numbers. And what we're trying to do is find what's going to be the format of the matrix so that this equation is true. Well, we know that matrices are tricky because matrix, matrix multiplication is not commutative. So what I'm asking you to do is find what elements are in fact commutative. Well, we know one, and that's the identity because we always know that the center is going to include the identity. And in that case, that's one, zero, zero, one. So let's go off of that a little bit and say, okay, let's let B and C be zeros. So when I do the matrix multiplication, I'm going to let any value that includes B or C be zero. So that's gonna get rid of BG and CE and BH and CF and CF and CH and EB and GB. Well, that makes things a lot easier because now all I need is for AE to equal AE, done, for DH to equal DH, done, to let AF equal DF, not done, and let DG equal AG, not done. But by some simple math, I can say that if A is equal to D, and if D is equal to A, then this is going to work out okay. So what is going to be the center? Well, the center of the general linear group two, oops, two R is going to be all matrices in the form A zero zero A for all A in R. Again, because we've let A equal to D, so as long as A is equal to D, so the first diagonal is the same and the second diagonal is zeros, we're going to be able to commute. Up next, we'll take a look at cyclic groups and their properties.